Good evening, good morning, and good day, wherever you are. Welcome to Biblical Quests. We are a worldwide scripture study community seeking to fulfill Yah's commandments to his followers to meditate on the Torah day and night, so that we may be like tree planted by streams of water that gives its fruit in its season, so all that we do will prosper. This is week 47 of our 52-week cycle of chronological reading through the Torah, Prophets, and Yeshua's words. The reading and open discussion will explore several sources, in particular the Dead Sea Scrolls, Septuagint, and the Hebrew-English Masoretic. Where relevant, we will also explore extra canonical books as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are humbled and excited to share this journey with you all. Let us pray. Father Yahweh, we want to magnify your name, give you glory, honor, and all praise. May your name be blessed. We pray that this reading, this study, will produce fruit, and that you will guide us through your Spirit, for it is our time that we invest in that you will guide us and lead us to where we can discover more about your truth. We ask that you bless us in this time and all that here. In Yeshua's name, Amen. Amen. Okay, so this week 47, the portions are the Torah portion, Deuteronomy chapter 17 through chapter 19, Prophets portion, Habakkuk chapter 1 through chapter 3, Yeshua portion, John chapter 15 through chapter 16. Let us begin. Deuteronomy chapter 17. You shall not sacrifice to Yahweh your God an ox or sheep that has a physical defect of anything seriously wrong, for that is a detestable thing to Yahweh your God. If there is found in one of your towns that Yahweh your God is giving to you a man or a woman that does evil in the eyes of Yahweh your God to transgress his covenant, and by going and serving other gods and so he bows down to them and to the sun or to the moon or to any of the host of heaven which I have forbidden, and it is reported to you or you hear about it and you inquire about it thoroughly and, indeed, the trustworthiness of the deed has been established, it has occurred, this detestable thing, in Israel. Then you shall bring out that man or that woman who has done this evil thing to your gates, that is, the man or the woman, and you shall stone them with stones to death. On the evidence of two or three witnesses the person shall be put to death. The person shall not be put to death by the mouth of one witness. The hand of the witnesses shall be first against the person to kill the person, and afterward the hands of all the people, and so you shall purge the evil from your midst. If a matter is too difficult for you, for example disputes between blood and blood, between legal claim and between assault and between matters of discernment in your towns, then you shall get up and you shall go to the place that Yahweh your God will choose. Then you shall go to the priests and the Levites and to the judge who will be in office in those days, and you shall inquire, and they shall announce to you the verdict. And you shall carry out exactly the decision that they announced to you from that place that Yahweh will choose, and you shall diligently observe according to all that they instruct you. And so according to the instruction of the law that they teach you and according to the decisions that they say to you, you shall do, you shall not turn from the word that they tell you to the right or to the left. And the man who treats with contempt so as not to listen to the priest who is standing to minister on behalf of Yahweh your God or to the judge, that man shall die, so you shall purge the evil from Israel. And all the people will hear and will be afraid, and they will not behave presumptuously again. When you have come to that land that Yahweh your God is giving to you and you have taken possession of it and you have settled in it, and you say, I will set over me a king like all the nations that are around me. Indeed. You may set a king over you whom Yahweh your God will choose, from the midst of your countrymen you must set a king over you, you are not allowed to appoint over you a man, a foreigner, who is not your countryman. Except, he may not make numerous for himself horses, and he may not allow the people to go to Egypt in order to increase horses, for Yahweh has said to you that you may never return. And he must not acquire many wives for himself, so that his heart would turn aside, and he must not accumulate silver and gold for himself excessively. And then when he is sitting on the throne of his kingdom, then he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll before the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere Yahweh your God by diligently observing all the word of this law and these rules. 
so as not to exalt his heart above his countrymen and not to turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, so that he may reign long over his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Okay, so before we start uh, sharing our insights on this chapter, I wanted to page back. Usually if we have a significant uh, variant between the versions, I would like to point it. So verse 18 in particular is interesting because in Hebrew it says that the king himself is supposed to write the, an entire scroll of the Torah when he takes position. And I'm guessing that was Yah's way of making sure that the king is, how can I say it, like he's... Uh, staying responsible. Yes, yeah, staying responsible, but also he's committing, that's what I want to say. He's committing all of the law into his memory through writing it. Both the, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Masoretic are saying the same thing and they're in agreement. However, the Septuagint said it a little bit different. It said that the priests are supposed to be writing it. So anyway, that was one change, that, one variant that I wanted to, to mention. So let's continue. All right, so I'll start with my notes I have on Deuteronomy 17. And what we see here is a, of a continuous discussion or mention purging evil from Israel and we see that by some of the, the commands that are put here. And these commands are so that the people will hear and will be afraid. In Deuteronomy 16, 21 through 17, 7, talking about forbidden forms of worship. And as you see the last one here, not to serve other gods, to bow down to them, and to the sun or the moon or any of the hosts of heaven. If found guilty, this one is stoned to death, first by the witnesses, then by the people. So here it is a purge of those who do not fear Yah. And we know what happens if you don't fear Yah and this action isn't being taken place for the people, then worship of other gods is what ends up happening. So then next is the, the legal decisions of the priests. So when legal matters came to be, all these things would be taken in front of the priests to exact, the, exact what was judged on it. And if the people did not listen to the priest, then that man shall die because the priest is acting on behalf of Yahweh the judge. So it's another thing, it's another serious position of the priests during that time to be respected. And then lastly on the concerns of Israel kings, main thing I wanted to point out there was back to Ronit's point, the king shall read it all the days of his life to learn and revere Yahweh by diligently observing all the words of the law and the rules so not to exalt his heart above his countrymen and not turn from a side of the commandments so we, we see that this instruction is key and important for the king to stay grounded in the word of Yah okay so I uh, I was intrigued by verses 16 and 17 and I'm asking whether Moses was hinting at someone in particular so Moses predicts that once the Israelites have taken possession and have settled in the promised land, they will ask for a king, like all the nations that are around them. Those are exactly the words that they used in 1 Samuel. He then issues the following warning, except he may not make numerous for himself horses, wives, silver and gold. Also in Deuteronomy and Exodus is warning the Israelites, yeah, Moses, is warning the Israelites in, the, in general and it sounds all too familiar. In Deuteronomy 7 is warning about intermarriage and he's saying you shall not give your daughter to their son and you shall not take his daughter for your son for their sons and daughters will cause your son to turn away from following me and so they will serve other gods and the anger of Yahweh would be kindled against you and he would quickly destroy you in Exodus 34 again he's saying be careful 
for yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you are going, lest it be a snare among you. And he's talking about the inhabitants inviting you and you eat their sacrifice and before you know it, they will cause your sons to prostitute themselves after their gods. Note that this prohibition was based on religion and not ethnicity as Yah's people were free to marry non-Israelites who converted to the worship of Yahweh like Rahav was a Canaanite, Ruth was a Moabite. Fast forward, Yah blessed Solomon with wisdom and very great discernment. First King chapter 3, 12 through 14. Behold, I do hereby do according to your word. I hereby give you a wise and discerning heart. There was no one like you before you, nor afterwards will one like you arise. Two, what you have not asked, I give to you, both riches and honor, so that no man among the kings will be like you all of your days. If, and now the condition comes, if you will walk in my ways, by keeping my statutes and my commandments as David your father walk, then I will lengthen your days. And you will see as in last week when we identified a certain values uh, of following Yah, devotion and obedience are two of them and that's what Yah was expecting from King Solomon. However, despite Solomon's great wisdom and discernment, he didn't heed Yah's and Moses' warnings. And as we read in 1 Kings, Solomon had 4,000 stalls for chariot horses and 12,000 horses. He also loved many foreign women, the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, Hittite, and so on, from the nations which Yahweh had said to the Israelites, you shall not marry them, and they shall not marry you. They will certainly turn your heart after their gods. But Solomon clung to them to love. He had 700 princes and 300 concubines as his wife, and his wife turned his heart. He also had a lot of gold. And remember the verse from last week portion, Deuteronomy 13, 4, you shall go, you shall walk after Yahweh your God, and him you shall revere, and his commandment you shall keep, and to his voice you shall listen, and him you shall serve, and to him you shall hold fast, cling. Okay, so instead of clinging to Yah, Solomon clung to his wives. The same word in Hebrew is used here for clinging to Yah that for Solomon and his wife. So Solomon's great knowledge and wisdom did not help him cling to Yahweh his God. And as we see in 1 Kings, it, it happened at the time of Solomon's old age that his wives guided his heart after other gods and his heart was not fully with Yahweh his God as the heart of David his father had been. Solomon went after Ashtoreth, Asherah, the God of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abhorrence of the Ammonite. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of Yahweh and did not fully follow after Yahweh as David his father. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice, and he had commanded him concerning this matter not to go after other gods, but he did not keep that which Yahweh commanded. And just that an entire nation paid dearly for one, not that twice after all man's folly and disobedience, 1 King 11, 11, so it's Yahweh said to Solomon, because this was with you and you did not keep my covenant and my, and my ordinances which I have commanded you, I will certainly tear the kingdom from you and I will give it to your servant. 
Solomon is the paradigmatic bad king as he not only broke the laws concerning kings in Deuteronomy 17, but he also violated the more general prohibition in Exodus 34 and Deuteronomy 7 regarding marrying foreign women. And just as God forewarned, Solomon's intermarriage led to apostasy. He worshipped the gods of other nations and even offered sacrifices to them. Solomon's idolatry led to Yahweh tearing the kingdom into two. Over the years, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah both declined until Israel was destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 BC and Judah was taken into captivity in 586 BC. Wow. I almost wanted to cry I know, when I said it. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 18. There shall not be for the Levitical priests, the whole tribe of Levi, a plot of ground and an inheritance with Israel. Rather they may eat an offering made by fire as their inheritance, for Yahweh. And there shall not be for them an inheritance of land in the midst of his brothers. Rather Yahweh is his inheritance, just as he promised to them. Now this shall be the share of the priest from the people, from those who sacrifice the sacrifice, whether it is an ox, sheep, or goat and they shall give the priest the shoulder and the jawbones and the stomach. The first fruits of your grain, your wine, and your olive oil and the first fruits of the fleece of your sheep you shall give to him. For Yahweh your God has chosen him from among all your tribes to stand to minister in the name of Yahweh, he and his sons forever. And if a Levite comes from one of your towns from anywhere in Israel where he is residing, he may come whenever he desires, to the place that Yahweh will choose. And he may minister in the name of Yahweh his God, just like all his brothers, the Levites who stand there before Yahweh. They shall eat equal portions, apart from what he may receive from the sale of his patrimony. When you come to the land that Yahweh your God is giving to you, you must not learn to do the detestable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you one who makes his son or his daughter go through the fire, or one who practices divination, or an interpreter of signs, or an augur, or sorcerer, or one who casts magic spells, or one who consults a spirit of the dead, or spiritist, or one who inquires of the dead. For everyone doing these things is detestable to Yahweh, and because of these detestable things Yahweh your God is driving them out from before you. You must be blameless before Yahweh your God. For these nations that you are about to dispossess listen to interpreters of signs and to diviners, but Yahweh your God has not allowed you to do the same. Yahweh your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your countrymen, and to him you shall listen. This is according to all that you asked from Yahweh your God at Horeb, on the day of the assembly, saying, I do not want again to hear the voice of Yahweh my God, and I do not want to see again this great fire, so that I may not die. And Yahweh said to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up a prophet for them from among their countrymen like you, and I will place my words into his mouth, and he shall speak to them everything that I command him. And then the man that will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I will hold accountable. However, the prophet that behaves presumptuously by speaking a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, and who speaks in the name of other gods, then that prophet shall die. And if you say to yourself, How can we know the word that Yahweh has not spoken it? Whenever what the prophet spoke in the name of Yahweh, the thing does not take place and does not come about, that is the thing that Yahweh has not spoken it. Presumptuously the prophet spoke it, you shall not fear him. So before we start, I just want to go back to verse 3 and again it's not that significant but it is interesting that in Hebrew the organ is stomach but in the Septuagint it was translated to great intestine honestly I don't know which is worse to eat the <laughs> stomach or the gut but, but that was a, an interesting uh, deviation here okay Okay, quickly our thoughts on, my thoughts on Deuteronomy 18. 
This is about the priests and the prophets. So here Yah's giving some some parameters on viewing priests and prophets and provisions. We see here that the priests, as most of you, they don't have a land inheritance and they may eat an offering made by fire as, a, as their inheritance. So they're going to be fed more or less by the group, the Israelites, so that they will be sustained by the group themselves because they are the priests. And this is where we see the actions even as today where priests, pastors, church leaders, etc., I guess you would say manage the church and people would donate or give quote tithes to them to sustain them. So it's a similar practice in essence that they are being supported by the group and they're not given that land inheritance like the others but being supported. Then it talks about abominable practices not to do those things that the na other nations do and shall not make your sons and daughters go through the fire, practicing divination, interpreting signs, sorcery, casting spells, consulting the dead, spiritists, inquiring of the dead, etc. Those are things that Yah tells us not to dabble in or to do. We must be blameless for Yahweh our God. And then he mentions about sending prophets. And he gives a, a marker here of how do we know a if a prophet's a real prophet, and it plainly says that whatever he speaks, if it does not come true, then he's not a prophet, and do not fear that prophet. And we see many people, especially predicting prophetic events, and then they're wrong. And if anyone hears or follows such people, then obviously once you realize that they are wrong, then you are not to fear them. You don't give them that respect at time of the day. You just move on because they're speaking it from either their self or from other means. And one thing I wanted to point out, once again, this is tying with chapter 17, is the purge. That prophet shall die if they are speaking falsely and leading others to another god. So once again, this purge to keep Israel pure and obedient. Yeah. So I just wanted to remind us that uh, the first king of Israel, King Saul, came from uh, the tribe of Benjamin and he committed one of those abom abominable practices. He actually went to a medium in the middle of the night and to have her raise the spirit of the then dead Samuel. And for that sin that he committed, he lost his kingdom and his lineage lo lost the he lost royalty from his lineage also. So that was an example of how he test this type of practices. Deuteronomy chapter 19. When Yahweh your God has exterminated the nations concerning whom Yahweh your God is giving to you their land, and you have dispossessed them, and you have settled in their towns and in their houses, you shall set apart three cities for you in the midst of your land that Yahweh your God is giving to you to take possession of it. You shall prepare the roads for yourselves, and you shall divide the regions of your land into thirds that Yahweh your God gives you as a possession, so that it will be available for any man's lair to flee there. Now this is the case of the man's lair who may flee there and live there who has killed his neighbor unintentionally, and he did not hate him previously. For example, when somebody goes with his neighbor into the forest to cut wood, and the iron head slips from the handle of the tool and strikes his neighbor and he dies, then he may flee to one of these cities, and so he may live. He does this lest the avenger of blood might pursue after the killer, because he is hot with anger and he overtakes him because it is a long distance to the city of refuge, and so he kills him, but he did not deserve a death sentence, because he was not hating him before. Therefore I am commanding you, saying, You shall set apart three cities. Then if Yahweh your God enlarges your territory just as he swore to your ancestors and gives to you all the land that he promised to give to your ancestors, then if you diligently observe this entire commandment that I am commanding you today by loving Yahweh your God and by going in his ways at all times, then you shall add three more cities for yourselves to these three. 
Do this so that innocent blood will not be shed in the midst of your land that Yahweh your God is giving to you as an inheritance and thereby blood guilt would be on you. But if someone hates his neighbor and lies in wait for him and rises up against him and murders him, and the murderer flees to one of these cities. Then the elders of his city shall send and take him from there, and they shall give him into the hand of the avenger of blood, and he shall be put to death. Your eye shall not take pity on him, and you shall purge the guilt of innocent blood from Israel, so that good will be directed toward you. You shall not move the boundary marker of your neighbor that former generations set up on your property in the land that Yahweh your God is giving to you to take possession of it. The testimony of a single witness may not be used to convict with respect to any crime and for any wrongdoing in any offense that a person committed, on the evidence of two witnesses or on the evidence of three witnesses a charge shall be sustained. If a malicious witness gets up to accuse anyone to testify against him falsely, then the two men to whom the legal dispute pertains shall stand before Yahweh, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. Then judges shall make a thorough inquiry, and if it turns out that the witness is a false witness and he testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he meant to do to his brother, and so you shall purge the evil from your midst. And the rest shall hear and shall fear, and they shall not continue to do such a thing again as this evil thing in your midst. You must show no pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Okay, so before we go into our thoughts, I just wanted to mention that throughout the chapters in Deuteronomy, in Hebrew, there are two terms that are used. One term is brother, and one term is acquaintance. So what I notice in the English translation, in most of the English translation, acquaintance is translated into neighbor, and the brother is translated into your countryman. <laughs> so I think my understanding is that whenever we see brother, the term is referring to your fellow Israelites. And whenever you see the word neighbor, it could mean a foreigner, it could be your fellow Israelite, or it could be a girl. And if you remember, I explained what girl is in the introduction presentation. Girl is actually a convert. In the script, in what we see, girl usually translated as a stranger. But, yes, yes, but, stranger or foreigner. So when you see stranger or foreigner many times, in Hebrew it shows as a convert. It may very well be a convert. Yeah, yeah. so it's very confusing how those terms are translated into English. What I noticed with the version of the LEB that we are using, they are very consistent when it comes to brother, they usually say countrymen. Yeah. Okay. Okay, on 19 I have here, broke it down regarding the laws concerning the cities of refuge. And here we see that they are to divide Israel's land into three regions. And each of those regions will have a city of refuge. So that each area, where they're located, if something happened that was an accident and someone died, that person could flee to the city within one day's journey is usually where these cities are located. I don't have the map, but when you look at the map of where the cities were located, it's usually about a day's journey for a at least a youthful man could travel, depending on how far away he is, in one day to get to that city for that for protection. And what's interesting is that these the city of refuge is also very similar to the grace that is given to us because this is talking about those committing murder accidentally. And we look at committing sin accidentally, not knowing, and that there is a covering through Yeshua on that. And then when it comes to intentional sins, it becomes another matter of seriousness on that. And we can discuss that another day. But here is a great example of how Yah provides. And then regarding the property boundaries, obviously don't move your neighbor's or your property marker. You want to be true with the land and property ownership. And then the laws concerning witnesses, we see this, and it's very important that everything everything needs to have at least 
two to three witnesses to make a matter right because there's so many false witnesses out there and even that you got to have you got to have people who are have integrity that can be a good witness to others and it's a challenge when there's false witnesses out there and what they can do but once again we see this that if there are false witnesses that make claims and they're found to be wrong what do you do purge the evil from Israel so once again if that false witness is proven false then whatever judgment was going to happen to the person that they were accusing of then they get that judgment on them so that's why it says eye for eye tooth for tooth hand for hand and foot for foot because it's something serious you don't falsely accuse somebody trying to get them in trouble or trying to hurt them and then if you're found guilty then you're going to get what they what you were trying to get them to be punished for So I was very intrigued by the use of eyes in Deuteronomy 19. And what I found out as I was digging in the in different Bible, biblical texts, uh, that our eyes are very powerful. Their function is far-reaching, way beyond merely transforming light and electrical signals into images. They may lead us astray, as we saw in Genesis 3, 5, for God knows that on the day you both eat from me, then your eyes will be opened and you both shall be like God's knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise, then she took from its fruit, its fruit and she ate and the rest is history. So the original uh, scene started actually with the eyes. They can be evil. In this context, they represent stinginess, selfishness, greed, covet covetousness, or scorn. The basic idea of the evil eye in the Hebrew scriptures appears at least five times. Each instance relates to money or material things and refers to viewing others through the lens of one's own wealth or gratification. In Proverbs 30, 17, provide, it provides another idea of evil eye. The eye that mocks a father and scorns the obedience of a mother, the ravens of the valley will peck it out and the offspring of vultures will eat it. The eyes also influence or affect our heart as in Matthew 5.28. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. They evoke hold emotions like the heart. In some cases they are interchangeable with the heart and we see it in Psalms 119 in several locations. My eyes long for your word, saying, when will you comfort me? My eyes long for your salvation and your righteous word. Streams of water flow down from my eyes because people do not heed your law. So the eyes uh, is a source of longing and sadness. And in 1 Kings 8.52, Oh, that your yeah, eyes may be open to the plea of your servant and to the plea of your people Israel to listen to them in all things when they call to you. So that's an interesting reference instead of saying asking yeah for his heart to be open it's asking for his eyes to be open to the plea of his people in this week's story portion they usher in pity and compassion to our heart so in verse 13 your eye shall not take pity on him and you shall purge the guilt of innocent blood from israel so that good will be directed toward you and again in verse 21 you must show no pity but in hebrew it literally says your eyes shall not take pity okay so the eyes are the one that take pity and to you and to Yah's heart too. In Ezekiel I found several verses, all in all of them Yah is talking about himself, 
his eye will not take pity. So he's using the same reference for himself. And then in Habakkuk, which we will shortly read in this week portion, in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 12 through 13, are you not from of old, O Yahweh my God, my Holy One, you shall not die. O Yahweh, you have marked them for judgment. O Rock, you have established them for a proof. Your eyes are too pure to see. And in this connotation in Hebrew, it means to tolerate even. And you are not able to look at wrongdoing. And last, uh, they help the eyes help usher usher in spiritual light or darkness to our life in Luke chapter 11 34 through 36 your eye is the lamp of the body when your eye is sincere your whole body is full of light also but when it is evil your body is dark also Therefore, pay careful attention that the light in you is not darkness. If therefore your whole body is full of light, not having any part dark, it will be completely full of light as when the lamp with its light gives light to you. So I just found a really beautiful sermon by a pastor named John Piper. I like what he says about this verse, this paragraph from Luke. Be careful. This is the only imperative in the text. Be careful what be careful what you regard as bright and attractive and compelling. If it is not Christ, you will be filled with darkness, no matter how bright it seems for a season. Candles seem bright until the sun comes out. Then they are useless and put away. Christ is the glory we were meant to see. His light alone will fill us and give the light of life and meaning to every part of our lives. And when that happens, we ourselves will shine and give off the rays of Christ. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be holy pride as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. Father Yah, open the eyes of our hearts to see the supreme greatness of your wisdom and power. Make our eyes good. Heal our blindness. Fill us with the all-pervading, all-exposing, all-purifying, all-pleasing light of your presence. Nice. Okay. Habakkuk chapter 1. Oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Yahweh. How long shall I cry for help, and you will not listen? How long will I cry out to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you cause me to see evil, while you look at trouble? Destruction and violence happen before me. Contention and strife arise. Therefore the law is paralyzed, and justice does not go forth perpetually. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore justice goes forth perverted. Look among the nations and see. Be astonished and astounded. For a work is about to be done in your days. That you will not believe if it is told. For look. I am raising up the Chaldeans. The bitter and impetuous nation. The one who walks through the spacious places of earth. To take possession of dwellings not belonging to it. They are dreadful and awesome. Their justice and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses are more swift than leopards. They are more menacing than wolves at dusk. Their horsemen gallop, their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle that is swift to devour. All of them come for violence. Their faces pressing forward. They gather captives like the sand. And they themselves scoff at kings. And rulers are a joke to them. They laugh at every fortification, and they heap up earth and take it. Then they sweep like the wind and pass on. They become guilty, whose might is their God. Are you not from of old? O Yahweh my God, my Holy One, you shall not die. O Yahweh, you have marked them for judgment. O Rock, you have established them for reproof. 
Your eyes are too pure to see evil. And you are not able to look at wrongdoing. Why do you look at the treacherous? Why are you silent when the wicked swallows up? Someone more righteous than him? You make humankind like fish of the sea. Like crawling creatures that have no ruler among them. He brings up all of them with a fish hook. He drags them up with his fish net. And he gathers them in his drag net. Therefore, he rejoices and exults. Therefore he sacrifices to his fish net. And makes offerings to his drag net. For by them he makes a good living. And his food is rich. Will he therefore empty his fish net? And continually kill nations without showing mercy? Habakkuk chapter 2 Will he therefore empty his fish net? And continually kill nations without showing mercy? I will stand at my post. And station myself on the rampart. And I will keep watch to see what he will say to me. And what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then Yahweh answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on the tablet, so that it might be read quickly. For there is yet a vision for the appointed time. It will give witness to the end, and it will not lie. If it tarries, wait, for it will surely come and not delay. Look! His spirit within him is puffed up. It is not upright. But the righteous shall live by his faithfulness. How much less the defiant! The arrogant, treacherous man, he who broadens his throat like Sheol, and who, like death, is not satisfied, and who gathers to himself all the nations, and harvested for himself all the peoples, will not succeed. Shall not all of these take up a taunt against him, with ridicule and riddles against him, saying, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his! For how long? And, Woe to him who makes himself heavy with pledges! Will not your creditors suddenly rise up? And awaken those who make you tremble? Then you shall be as plunder for them. Because you plundered many nations. All the remaining nations will plunder you. On account of the blood of humanity. And violence against the land. And against cities and all who live in them. Woe to him who obtains profit from evil gain for his house to set his nest on high, to be saved from the hand of misfortune. You have plotted shame for your house, cutting off many peoples, and sinning against your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the plaster from the wood will answer it. Woe to him who builds a city by blood guilt, and who founds a city by wickedness. Look, is it not from Yahweh of hosts? that people labor for mere fire, and nations exhaust themselves for mere vanity. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh, like the waters covering the sea. Woe to him who gives a drink to his neighbors, pouring out your wrath and also making them drunk, in order to see their nakedness. You will be sated with shame rather than glory. Drink also yourself, and expose yourself. The cup of the right hand of Yahweh will come around upon you and disgrace upon your glory. For the violence of Lebanon will cover you and the destruction of wild animals will shatter them on account of the blood of humanity and the violence against the land, against a city and all the inhabitants in it. What value is an idol when its carver has fashioned it? A molten idol, a teacher of lies? For he who fashioned his creation trusts in it, though making mute idols. Woe to him who says to the wood, Wake up! And to a lifeless stone, Arise! Can he teach? Look, it is covered with gold and silver, and there is no breath within it. But Yahweh is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Okay, so I wanted to page back and just review some of the comments uh, regarding the variants and also I want to read the comment from the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible authors 
So Habakkuk, the subject of one of the most exp extensive Pesher texts, uh, Pesher, as I mentioned, is a commentary or interpretation, also exists in three of the ten minor prophet manuscripts from the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Pesher on Habakkuk exploits the original setting of the prophecy set in the early 6th century BC and the disturbing messages of the coming of the Chaldean God's agents of judgments on sinful Judah to interpret the events of 500 years later. The Chaldean become the Kittim or Romans and the unjust of Judah are none other than the foes of the Qumran community, the Pharisees. Oddly, apart from this extensive pressure, there are no citations or allusions to Habakkuk among the scrolls. First of all, the Dead Sea Scrolls only give commentary on the first two chapters of Habakkuk and as you will see shortly, the third chapter is very odd. It, it sounds like a psalm, almost not connected to the first two chapters. Another odd thing and enigmatic thing about Habakkuk is that no one knows who he is. If you look at every book of the prophets, the major and the minor prophets, they always start by saying who is that prophet, this is uh, the son of, and then he wrote in the days of this king or that king. There is always a time and some lineage tied to a prophet. Habakkuk is a minor prophet that no one knows who he is. No one knows when he, he wrote his prophecy and no, no one knows to whom he was referring. So the Dead Sea Scroll community, they, in their interpretation, they understood him to talk about not the Chaldeans but about the Romans and they looked at the prophecy that he gave as the prophecy on what the Romans were going to do to Judah. Yeah, I found it interesting that their commentary at that time was positioning the Chaldeans as Romans and the unjust Judah as the Pharisees. Yes. And I, th I think that's very interesting yeah. because the Pharisees were against the Qumran community as we read earlier that in our introduction we touch on that but it's a very interesting thought that these guys are writing their commentary and it's yeah it's it's right against the pharisees and romans during this time yeah and then of course i color coded the variants and i just wanted to draw your attention to a couple of them the verse eight in the septuagint uh, is interesting in Hebrew it says evening wolves and evening, the word evening in Hebrew, Erev, can also, if you change the Nikud, if you change the pronunciation, instead of Erev you can say Arav, and Arav is Arabia. In the Septuagint the, it doesn't make sense wolves of Arabia, I think it makes more sense to say wolves, evening wolves, because uh, well, uh, wolves are nocturnal, nocturnal right? Usually. Yeah. Another one that uh, verse 9 is just like what I marked in yellow. That whole thing doesn't even exist in Hebrew. That whole sentence, destruction, shall come upon ungodly men resisting with their adverse front. That's fine, but it doesn't appear in Hebrew, not even in the Dead Sea Scroll. Another thing... So obviously it's in the Greek Septuagint, but not here. Yeah, yeah, but not in the Hebrew or in the Dead Sea Scroll. There was... Oh, another interesting variant was in chapter 2, verse 11. So in Hebrew it literally says, For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the plaster from the wood will answer it. But somehow I don't know why they translated it into a beetle but it's not a beetle and then verse 14 is a really very poetic verse talking about the glory of Yah like water covering the sea the ocean 
feeling the ocean and here they just mentioned water but they didn't mention the ocean and that's it so now we'll go back to that i think that's interesting that it says for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the lord as the waters cover the sea and we know when the terminology of sea in revelation is the peoples of the world so it's interesting that you could tie that into that yeah and i'm going to say a few things about that virus okay. about the water or so uh, it good, will good to hear. tie okay Okay, so the first thing I wanted to share is about the Pesher. So in the Qumran community, they wrote commentaries on almost every manuscript. And one of the most beautiful things that was found was the Pesher on Habakkuk. And you can see an actual picture of it. It's, they found it almost complete, uh, except for Pesher of Habakkuk and also the book of Isaiah, most of the manuscript were broken. But this one was a perfect manuscript with just very few places that you can see in the picture that are torn. It's very long, it's almost one and a half meters long. It was one of the original scrolls that was discovered in 1947. It interprets the first two chapters of Habakkuk. And I explained here on how Pesher, how they wrote the Pesher. So you can, you're welcome to refer to it later. And it is apparent from the manuscript that it was the purposeful intent of the scribe to write an explanation of only the first two chapters. It is not to be considered as missing because the scroll was damaged in some way. A view of the last page shows conclusively that there was plenty of room on the last two pages. You can see it on the left side, okay, to include more text if that was the author intent. But the author was only intent on, um, on interpreting the first two chapters. What is even more significant than the commentary and the pressure is the quoted text of Habakkuk itself. The divergences between the Hebrew text of the scroll and the standard Masoretic text is startlingly minimal. The biggest differences are word order, small chromatical variations, additions or omissions of conjunction, and spelling variation, but these are small enough not to, to do any damage to the meaning of the text. And if when we are done, you can look again at the comparison that I did, you can see that I hardly found any differences. Okay, and I'll, I'm going to point out on Habakkuk 2, verse 16, talking about the appointed time of the proud one as we read that. And it gives some, some markers on this proud one. For this appointed time of him his soul is not right he cannot be satisfied he is as death he gathers all the nations and all the peoples he will plunder many nations and all the remnant of the peoples through violence and blood woe to him that increases what is not his so that could be debt that could be unfair gain so here's a warning to the people who increase what is not theirs so whether that is something they they acquired unfairly unjustly or it, to me it could in, it also include getting into debt by increasing what is not his because he doesn't have the money to pay for it himself so it's something to think about and loads himself down with thick mud which when looking that up it was like an idiom when you look at those words it also referred to as debt when you load loading yourself down with debt so this was an obvious woe to those getting in debt and unfair gain etc warnings for people your creditor shall rise up suddenly causing you to tremble then you shall be as booty for them so obviously this sentence following confirms that's what that means prior woe to those who greedily gain for the for their elevated dwelling to be delivered from harm you have devised shame to your house by cutting off many peoples and have sinned against yourself. So I, I also tied this to Revelation, and I'll probably drop that in, in into the chat too. I didn't include that in the slide, but I'll drop a slide on that. And that's it for this one here.
Then in Habakkuk 2.4, talks about, but the righteous shall live by his faith. And it's just one verse on that. And all of the other negative stuff about the pr proud one. And then he talks about the righteous shall live by his faith. Last year when we did the Hebrew Gospel of Yaakov, chapter 2, verses 19 to 26. Explain what is Yaakov. Because some oh, James. Yeah, James. It's Gospel of James, which was written to the 12 tribes scattered into all the places. He says here, you believe that Yahweh is one, you do well. The enemies, Satan's, also believe so, and they tremble. So we see belief is not deep enough, because even the enemies believe, and they tremble. So faith without works is dead. Abraham justified by his works when he brought his son as an offering on the altar. Faith by works is made complete, and by this the Torah was established which is said, and Abraham believed in Yahweh, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Why, did he, why was it said he believed in Yahweh? Because he brought his son as an offering to the altar. He was justified by his works. He did it. He was going to do what he believed. And so that's why he was justified and reckoned as righteous. Now you all are able to see that one is justified by one's works, not only by the faith. Rakav the harlot was justified by the works when she received the spies and hid them. For as the body without the Ruach is dead, so faith without works is dead. Amen. I wanted to add that because it says the righteous shall live by his faith. What does that mean? What does faith mean? And if you read these verses here in James, you will see that living by faith is the actions the provability of your faith and it's made complete in righteousness anyone can say they believe even the enemy the satans believe but they and they tremble but they don't do the just work that we should do in obedience so that's what i want to add so going back to verse 14 for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh, like the waters covering the sea. Living water in relationship to Yahweh is mentioned in other books too. Jeremiah 17.13 O Yahweh, the hope of Israel, all those who forsake you will be put to shame, and those who turn aside from you in the earth will be recorded, for they have forsaken the fountain of living water, Yahweh. Ezekiel 36:25, And I will sprinkle on you pure water, and you will be clean from all of your uncleanliness, and I will cleanse you from all of your idols. Ezekiel 43:2. And look, the glory of the God of Israel, it came from the way of the east and its sound was like the sound of many waters and the land radiated due to his glory. Zechariah 14.8 And then on that day, living waters will flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and the other half to the western sea. Psalms 32.6 For this because everyone who is godly, pious, shall pray to you in time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. And Psalms 42, 1, As a deer longs for streams of water, so my soul longs for you, O God. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, Yah is compared to living water in several verses, in several books in the Bible. And I came across the oracle of Agur, it's Proverbs chapter 30. It's a, it's a very beautiful oracle. I'm not going to read all of it, but I took excerpts from that oracle and I thought it really ties a lot of what we saw in today in this week Torah and Prophets portion. So let me read. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in the hollow of his hand? Who has wrapped water in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is the name of his child? That's interesting. 
For surely every word of God is flawless. He is a shield for him who takes refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Two things I ask from you. Do not deny me before I die. Keep falsehood and a lying word far from me. Do not give me poverty or wealth. Provide me with food only for my need. Or else I will be satisfied and will deny him and say, Who is Yahweh? Or I will be poor and will steal and profane the name of my God. There is a generation that will curse its father and its mother it will not bless. There is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, but from its filthiness it will not be cleansed. There is a generation, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids they will lift. There is a generation whose teeth are swords and its jawbones knives, in order to devour the poor from the earth and the needy from humankind. If you have been foolish by exalting yourself, and if you have devised evil, put your hand to your mouth, for pressing milk produces curd, and pressing nose produces blood, <coughs> and pressing anger produces strife. So I just saw so many elements and motifs from today's, this week portion. The water, <coughs> Sorry, the water taking refuge in Yah, uh, not doing evil, staying away from evil, the eyes again are pretty dominant here. And then I really like when he says, when he asks Yah, and he said, Do not give me poverty or wealth, provide me with food only for my need, or else I will be satisfied satisfy and will deny him and say who is Yahweh mm. and I thought about King Solomon who got so much that finally he also said who is Yahweh and he started worshiping other idols yeah I like the, the verses here with the this generation there is a generation there is a generation there is a generation and all of those sound very familiar yes exactly Habakkuk chapter 3 the prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shijanath. O Yahweh, I have heard the report of you. O Yahweh, I stand in awe of your works. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, may you remember to show compassion. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His splendor covers the heavens and his praise fills the earth, and his brightness was like the light. Flashing rays came from his hand for him, and there is the covering of his strength. Before him went disease, and pestilence went out at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. Then the mountains of old were shattered. The hills of old collapsed. The ways of old belonged to him. Under affliction I saw the tents of Kishon. The tent curtains of the land of Midian trembled. Was the anger of Yahweh against the rivers? Was your wrath against the rivers? Or your fury against the sea? When you mounted upon your horses, upon your victory chariot, you laid bare the nakedness of your bow, swearing oaths with the arrows of your word. You split the earth with rivers. When the mountains saw you they writhed, a torrent of waters swept by. The deep gave its voice. It raised its hands on high. Sun and moon stood still in their place. At the light of your arrows they moved about. At the gleam of the flashing of your spear. In fury you marched through the earth. In anger you trampled the nations. You went forth for the salvation of your people. For the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of wickedness laying bare from the foundation to the top. You pierced the head of his warriors with his own arrows. They came like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their exultation like one who devours the afflicted in ambush. You trampled upon the sea with your horses. The churning of many waters. 
I hear and my stomach shakes. My lips quiver at the sound. Infection enters my bones. That which is beneath me trembles. I wait quietly for the day of trouble. To come upon the people attacking us. Though the fig tree does not blossom. Nor there be fruit on the vines. The yield of the olive tree fails. And the cultivated fields do not yield food. The flock is cut off from the animal pen. And there is no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in Yahweh. I will exult in the God of my salvation. Yahweh, my Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer. He causes me to walk on my high places. To the choir master with stringed instruments. Okay. So before we proceed with comments, let me see. I'm going back to page 39 just to discuss the variants again. Verse 2. Again, the translation in the Septuagint. I don't even know if it's if it has the same a, a close meaning. It's really completely different yeah. than what it says in English. I found it interesting. Then verse three, both of us uh, were captivated by it, and we have some things to share about it. Again, verse four, the complete verse was not translated exactly like the Hebrew. Uh, let's see if there was anything else. Verse 10, Septuagint says nations, but the Hebrew actually says mountain in both the DSS and the Masoretic. And, and then the, the DSS are actually says the clouds poured out water uh, where in the Masoretic it just says water passed by or something like this. And again, uh, verse 11, the translation in the Septuagint is different. My, my, my conclusion is maybe, the, maybe it was too poetic and when you deal with prose and poetry, it could be interpreted a little bit different or translated Well, yeah, whenever you're dealing with poetry, the way the word structure is in a, in a poem may not make sense when you translate it to another yeah. language, that is for sure. So it's very possible. And I did want to point out on number 11 is that the Masoretic and Dead Sea Scrolls say the shining of your glittering spear or flashes of your spear. And I find it interesting, Septuagint is the brightness of the gleaning of your arms. Yeah. So I th think that's interesting too because I'm going to comment on that. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, here, the day of trouble in Habakkuk 3. Yah comes from Teman, Edom, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, most likely Sinai Peninsula. So a couple things that it's speaking about the Holy One. Comes forth for salvation of his people. He is bright as light, and his hands had rays of light. And then we also saw, we talked about the chapter, verse 11, with the arms of light in the Septuagint. It says, fiery bolts at his feet came forth pestilence. His glittering spear shot arrows of light, or could have been his hands or arms, either or, but we see it, it, it was already mentioned. He threshes the wicked nations in his anger. And so I compared that to the Re Revelation when we did the study last year on the Hebrew Revelations series. And I put in there the rider of the white horse, how there's some similarities to the rider of the white horse, as you can see. And then it talks about, though the fig tree shall not flourish, and each one of these little phrases that is kind of, is more or less signifying this time frame. And the fig tree shall not flourish, to me, represents no prosperity, nor shall fruit be in the vines. That's no love, because fruit bearing fruit, the fruits of the Spirit, is love. The labor of the olive shall fail, and that's no righteous works, because we know we are the bride, the bridesmaids get the oil for their lamps, and that is the righteous works. The field shall yield no food, so that's no food in the land. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, no fellowship during this time. It's everyone's. It's going to be a rough, tough time and, and for fellowship and scarcity. There shall be no herd in the stalls, and that's no unity in, among the land and, and people. So that's how I interpreted that with this day of trouble scenario that's going on. So I hope that might have been helpful for others to see. Beautiful. As we mentioned earlier, Rob and I actually, we work on our 
insights and study separately. So it's very interesting when we come together when actually the same virus caught both of our, our attention. So this virus definitely did it for both of us. Okay. Okay. So Yahweh's march from the south. God came moving across. So in Hebrew, that's the accurate translation would be God came moving across from Te Teman, which is a dome, the Holy One from Mount Paran or Mount Sinai. Selah, his splendor covers the heavens and his praise fills the earth. And his brightness was like the light, flashing rays came from his hand for him, and there is the covering of his strength before, before him. Uh, when disease and pestilence went out at his feet, he stood and measured the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. Then the mountains of old were shattered. The hills of old collapsed. The ways of old belonged to him. Under affliction, I saw the tents of Kushan, the tent curtains of the land of Midian trembled. So, I just wanted to explain a little bit the different uh, references here. So, Teman was one of the largest cities in the nation of Edom, that nation that was founded by Esau and populate, populated by his descendants. Edom was located in the wilderness region to the south of Israel, lying between Israel and Egypt. The city of Teman was named for Esau's grandson, Teman. Mount Sinai is twice referred to as Mount Paran in the Old Testament. In Moses' blessing upon Israel prior to his death, he made a clear connection between Mount Sinai and Mount Paran. Habakkuk is referring to how Yah displayed awesome power in bringing the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage and to Mount Sinai. Actually, Habakkuk's references to Teman, Teman and Mount Paran are only two of his references to this event. Two more are found in verse 7, where he says, under affliction I saw the tents of Kushan, which is Ethiopia, the tent curtains of the land of Midian, most likely located northeast of the Gulf of Aqaba near Edom, trembled. Alluding to the fact that the reports of Yah bringing the Israelites out of Egypt by way of the ten plagues and the parting of the Red Sea caused fear among all the nations of that part of the world. In describing how Yah delivered Israel from Egypt, Habakkuk poetically depicts Yah as being blindingly bright and having rays flashing from his hand pestilence went before him, fever followed in his wake, the mountains scattered before him and the hills bowed. On and on the description goes like that. And what Habakkuk wants is for Yah to once again display such awesome power in delivering Israel from its enemies. And to be honest, that's how we feel yep. right now with yep. everything that we are going through. So another thing I wanted to share with you, so there are many theories as to where Mount Sinai is, and I studied so many of them at length, and for a while I really subscribed to the theory that it's in Saudi Arabia, and I, I dug it, but it didn't make sense to me that it would be so far away. So when I read these uh, verses in Habakkuk, and I did a little bit more research, I came across an article, two articles actually, and I included the links on this slide and in the PDF you can click on those links and read those articles later. Very interesting. And both of those articles are placing Mount Sinai very close to the Negev area where Rob and I visited a few months ago in Israel. 
and, and Paran. In Deuteronomy 33, 1, 2, now this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the Israelites before his death. Then he said, Yahweh came from Sinai, and he dawned upon them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with myriads of holy ones at his right hand, a fiery law for them. This is Moses recounting a similar story to Habakkuk. And Seir, by the way, is another term for Edom. Okay, that's uh, Seir actually means hairy, and es Esau was hairy, and that's why that's another name for Edom. And in Judges, uh, Yahweh, when you went down from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the air trembled, the heavens poured down, the clouds poured down water, the mountains trembled before Yahweh, this Sinai, the presence of Yahweh, the God of Israel. That's from the song of Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam. So, anyway, it's really interesting, read those two articles and we just visited that area a few months ago and definitely we can see how uh, there are craters there that no one can explain those craters and who knows maybe that's what Habakkuk is referring to when he says that hills and mountains were torn torn out of place and then you when you look at this satellite view of that area you can definitely see that water was prevalent there yeah at some um, point yeah at yeah. some point so anyway it's just i wanted to share and that one before you go yeah it's in this area right around here in case people could see the mouse yeah john chapter 15 i am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser Every branch that does not bear fruit in me, he removes it, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it in order that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I in you, just as the branch is not able to bear fruit from itself unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me, and I in him, this one bears much fruit. For apart from me, you are not able to do anything. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown out as a branch, and dries up. And they gather them, and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have spoken these things to you in order that my joy may be in you and your joy may be made complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I loved you. No one has greater love than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, because the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, because everything that I have heard from my father I have revealed to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and your fruit should remain, in order that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. The world hates you. You know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, for this reason the world hates you. Remember the word that I have said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But they will do all these things to you on account of my name, because they do not know the one who sent me. 
If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they do not have a valid excuse for their sin. The one who hates me hates my father. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated both me and the father. But this happens so that the word that is written in their law would be fulfilled. They hated me without a reason. When the advocate comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, that one will testify about me. And you also will testify, because you have been with me from the beginning. John chapter 16. I have said these things to you, so that you will not fall away. They will expel you from the synagogue, but an hour is coming that everyone who kills you will think they are offering service to God, and they will do these things because they do not know the Father or me. But I have said these things to you, so that when their hour comes, you may remember what I told you about them. But now I am going away to the one who sent me, and none of you is asking me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. But I tell you the truth. It is better for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I am going away to the Father, and you will see me no more. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you are not able to bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in all truth. For he will not speak from himself, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will proclaim to you the things to come. He will glorify me, because he will take from what is mine and will proclaim it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he takes from what is mine and will proclaim it to you. A little while and you will see me no more. And again a little while and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he is saying to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again a little while and you will see me. And because I am going away to the Father. So they kept on saying, What is this that he's saying? A little while? We do not understand what he is speaking about. Jesus knew that they were wanting to ask him, and he said to them, Are you deliberating with one another about this? That I said a little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while you will see me? Truly I say to you, that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will become sorrowful but the sorrow will change the joy. A woman, when she gives birth, experiences pain because her hour has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the affliction on account of the joy that the human being has been born into the world. So you also are experiencing sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take away your joy from you. And on that day, you will ask me nothing. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. I have said these things to you in a figurative sayings. An hour is coming when I will speak to you in figurative sayings no longer, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. On that day, you will ask in my name and I will not say to you what I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and I you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I have gone out from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and I am going to the Father. His disciples said, Behold, now you are speaking plainly, and are telling us no figurative sayings. Now we know that you know everything and do not need for anyone to ask you questions. By this we believe that you have come from God, Jesus replied to them. Now do you believe? Behold, an hour is coming, and has come, that you will be scattered, each one of you, to his own home, and you will leave me alone, and I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I have said these things to you so that in me 
You may have peace. In the world, you have affliction. But have courage. I have conquered the world. Okay. So with that, we'll, I'll start with John chapter 15, 1 through 8. talks about the vine of truth and the, and the vine of the earth. So here we see Yeshua mentioning the vine of truth. And we also have the vine of the earth is what I call it. And so we see here that he mentions the branches that do not bear fruit will be removed. And the branches that do bear fruit in him, he cleans in order that they should bear fruit to abundance. And this cleaning is what a lot of people don't understand in our lives, in our walk, that there may be some things that come and take place in our lives that may be perceived as hardships and they very likely may be hardships but these things that happen in our lives may be a cleaning so that we may be able to bear more fruit that the father knows that we can bear or we're praying for if we're praying that his will be done if we're being diligent praying for his guidance and for us to bear more fruit we may have some challenging times ahead of us in order for him to work through us through these events in order for us to bear more fruit. He says, abide in me and I in you. You are not able to make fruit unless you abide in me. And then it is he who bears much fruit and that's Yeshua. So we abide in him and the fruit will come forth if we're abiding in him. Yeshua will make sure that happens or the spirit of truth. If one does not abide in me, he is sent outside. We've seen that term mentioned many times like the unclean or sent out the city gates everything's being all the negative stuff is outside of the gates etc here we see the branch being put outside it dries out and then it's gathered and put in the fire and burns so we are to be producing fruit not drying up not not withering away if you abide in me and keep my words in you anything that you ask the father he will give your desire and i think that is very much so if it is in line with his will and that we are to glorify and exalt the Father, and that we are to bear fruit and make disciples. So that is what he is telling us to do as being part of the vine of truth. All right, here we see tying that to the vine of the earth. So in Revelation 14, 14 through 20, I'll read this quickly. I saw a bright cloud, and on it sat one of the appearance of a man, and on his head was a crown of gold. And in his hand was a sickle. And we see this person, this being, harvesting the earth. And the angel cries out with a loud voice to thrust the sickle in the harvest, for the time of the harvest has come. And he thrusts the sickle in the, and harvests. And then another messenger came out, and he had a sickle in his hand. And an angel came out and said to, to thrust that sickle. And he thrust the sickle and harvest the grapes of the earth. For the fruits are ripe for the messenger thrust with the sickle and harvested the grapes of the earth and cast them into the great winepress of fury of Yahweh. And the winepress was outside the city and the blood and the winepress went up to the broad sprout. So we, here we see another example of this vine being taken outside the city and into the winepress where we just read in John, these the branches are burned. And here it, it's an example of taking the grapes of the earth, the fruit of the earth, which which is the opposite of the fruits of the spirit, and taking that and just pressing that out in the fury of Yahweh. So just imagine that. And then we read here in Psalms 19.9, which correlates to John, the fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true. They are righteous altogether. The fear of Yahweh leads to life so that one may sleep satisfied, untouched by evil. And that was Proverbs 19.23. And then last, Revelation 14.7. And he said with a great voice, Fear Yahweh and do prayer to him, for the judgment day has come, and do prayer to him who created the heavens and the earth and seas and the fountains. So we see once again, Yahweh, the fear of Yahweh is clean. And it talks about us, the branches being cleaned. And that is mentioning to those who fear Yahweh once again. And like I said, we are being cleaned in order to bear more fruit. Okay, now I want to talk about the Ruach HaKodesh and the Ruach of Truth that's mentioned in verses 7 and 9. Most of the translations have the pronoun he tied to it, and in the Greek it's neuter. So I put it in neuter so we can read this. However, I say to you that it is necessary for you that I should go up, 
For if I do not go up, Ruach HaKodesh will not come to you. But if I go, I will send. And when that one coming will take and lay hold of the world because of the sin and of the righteousness and of the judgment of iniquity because they do not believe in me. And then 13 we read, But when the Ruach of truth will come and will teach you all truth, not speaking of its own heart, only the words which it hears it will speak and make known to you those words. So the Ruach of truth will teach you all truth. I want to tie that in with Psalms 25, 4 to 5. Show me your ways, Yahweh. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. I wait for you all day long. Psalm 119, 160. All of your words are true. Every one of your righteous ordinances endures forever. And here we see in tied in with John chapter 8, 31 to 32. Then Yeshua said to the Yadim who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you will become my disciples in truth. And you will know truth, and the truth will fulfill your requests. So the Ruach of truth teaches truth. Yahweh, his words teach truth. And if you abide in Yeshua's words, you will know truth. So we see that it is truth that sets us free in the Father and the Son and the Ruach of truth. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. And that's John 17, 17 as mentioned there. All right, so talking about the spirit of truth. Now let's go to the distresses in the world that's mentioned in John 16. Here it says, but the world will be glad when you weep and you will be anxious, but your anxiousness will be turned into joy. And then in 22 to 24, and the truth, so is your anxiousness, but I will see you again and your heart will be glad and no man will take away your joy from you. And that day you will not ask me anything. Truth, I say to you, if you ask the Father, Anything in my name you will ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. So it says here, if you love Yeshua, you ask the Father directly. Not Yeshua. You ask in Yeshua's name. That's in, he, He's telling us. We are to ask the Father, not Yeshua, but we ask in his name. Wow. So verse 33, you will be scattered and may have shalom in me alone. For you will have distress in the world, but trust in me for he conquered the world. So the scriptures tells us we will have stress in this world. It's part of the cleaning of our branch to produce more fruit. And if people understand that this life is a test for our souls to trust and obey and believe and live as the example of Yeshua, we will see the fruit that we are bearing here and now through the hardships, through the testing, will be, and he says, will be greatly magnified in the next life. So I just wanted to draw all that together from what I got from John 16 here. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. I wanted to mention a couple of thoughts about work of truth and uh, the Holy Spirit actually in Hebrew is spirit of holiness and spirit of truth okay so those two terms were not mentioned at least in the masoretic version of the hebrew bible they were not mentioned even once not even once and for me personally one of the objectives that i have by doing this study with the dead sea scrolls and key and comparing on a weekly basis comparing all the verses is because I want to see if by any chance one or both of those terms were mentioned in the original oldest manu Hebrew manuscripts that we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That would be so interesting. Yeah, it's important because here we have Yeshua talking about sending the Ruach HaKadosh and the Spirit of Truth and we're not seeing this mentioned exactly in the Torah and the Tanakh. So perhaps it's in a different format of a name and that's something that I know we'll put together here. Hopefully this year we'll yeah. be able to pull that together so we can have a better comparison to the Holy Spirit, so to speak, and the Spirit of Holiness that's mentioned once. Yeah. 
the last page is the variant stickers so this week DSS to Masroetic hardly nothing I just found one insignificant variant LXX to Masroetic was pretty intense quite a few variants and then DSS to LXX also quite a few variants but all in all like in the big scheme of things I'm finding very minor deviation between the texts mm. far. Yeah, so far and that's it thank you so much everyone and we are going to turn off the recording and open the floor for discussions questions your insights we would love to hear from you yes thank you all and be blessed <laughs>